the subject today is Mehrbaba on war and destruction. And this presentation is not meant to be sensational, but it's a subject that is often ignored because it can be a bit startling and the context is large. Mostly I'll be reading. These are things that are published and some unpublished, things that many of us have read or heard through the years, and some you may not have heard of. War and destruction have always been a common feature of the divine plan. It's a means for the perfect masters in the avatar to shake humanity loose from all sanskaric patterns that have distracted them from the real purpose of life, that is to experience truth, God. We have seen that during the avataric advents, there is usually involvement with wars and military. Look back at the Ramayana, the Mahabharata during Krishna's advent, the Roman Empire during the time of Jesus. The advent of Muhammad was almost a statement of the war against falseness. His whole advent was a military campaign, it seemed. Beginning in this advent, Baba stated that, for example, the last great work done by Sai Baba as Kutubi Irshad, that is the main perfect master of the five, was to direct World War I. Millions of people died in World War I, but actually tens of millions of people died and the flu pandemic that happened, and largely around the six-week, two-month period when Sai Baba dropped his body in October 1918, he apparently died of typhoid himself. Baba talked about these events. The first example I'm going to give you is from July 9th, 1925, before Baba began his long silence. That evening, Baba and the Mondali were seated on the veranda of the post office. Remember, the close women Mondali at that time were staying inside the building, and on the large veranda outside is where the Mondali and others would gather. Baba gave a very interesting and grossing discourse on the post office veranda, which was followed with rapt attention by all, of course, because they believed it was going to be his last lecture for many months to come. At the time, he said he was going to keep silence for a year. The theme could be divided into three distinct subjects. First, the Uptesh focused on the necessity of living for others and using up one's own body for the sake of others. Second, the explanatory part dealt with the reasons for his silence, which primarily came to heavy spiritual workings considering the passing of Hazrat Babajan within the next few years. The third part of the lecture hinted at the future of the world, which meant communal fighting and world wars, natural disasters that would take millions of lives, all resulting in an unimaginable free flowing of blood throughout the world in general, and particularly in India. At that point, Baba turned to Gulmai, who was sitting next to him, one of the few women who was present on the veranda, and remarked in Gujarati, I will dip my kerchief in that river of blood and tie it around my head. Not until the world cries out for God will I give up my silence. So this is the first hint that his silence is going to be longer than a year. Padre was there and remembered this very dramatic statement. He would recall it from time to time. But then Baba explained that after these great devastations, a reign of peace and tranquility was promised to the world. This next incident is from January 1928, when Baba was staying in seclusion in the crypt cabin on the hill and fasting. This is exactly in that period of a few weeks when Baba was giving those lectures to the boys, which Ward Parks has recently published in the form of the book, Creation and Its Causes. Before retiring that night, January 5th, Bob asked Gustaji and the watchman to make sure that no one came near the crypt cabin that night, within a hundred feet or so. 
The next morning, now January 6th, a dozen soldiers passing by were granted permission to come up the hill from Baba's Darshan before 8 a.m. After Baba's brother Jal escorted them to Baba at the door of the cabin, they lined up and gave him a smart military salute before having his darshan. That morning, Baba ordered the school to be closed at 11 a.m. and had the boys and Manali come to the crypt room to participate in his ceremonial bath and the washing of his feet. Afterwards, Baba had his brother Baram read out a declaration concerning a meeting of spiritual masters that had taken place in the crypt cabin the previous night, wherein it was decided that a great war would soon begin. The arrival of the soldiers that morning was a result of the meeting. The subject was not new to the Mandali, since first coming to Marabad from time to time, Baba would refer to another inevitable world war, which would be much worse than the first one, but necessary before the manifestation of the avatar could happen. However, that day Baba commented, Today is the day on which the foundation of the future activities of my universal work in this avatar period has been laid. That was during the Mayor Ashram Prem Ashram period. Years went by. In 1931, as you know, Baba began making his trips to the West. During that first trip, Baba the Mandali took a ship to Karachi and Chanji was told by Baba to get second-class berths. But when they arrived in Karachi, on that ship, there were no second-class berths available, as Janji was told. So Baba said, don't worry about it. Book another ship. Baba had a lover in Karachi, a follower named Jamshed Mehta, who happened to be the mayor of Karachi. He had a lot of influence, and he did a lot of work for Baba whenever Baba was in that area. He did his best to do certain things for Baba. There was a discussion that Mahatma Gandhi was now going for the first time also to the West of the Round Table Conference. And Baba told Jamshed Mehta, if I go to England, I'll take Gandhi with me. So there was another ship coming. Gandhi got on it. It was coming from Bombay. And in an interview with newspaper reporters, Gandhi's comment was, I must go to London with God as my only guide. So that ship stopped in Karachi, and there were second-class berths on that ship, and they were booked on that ship. You know the rest of the story, how Jamshed Mehta told Gandhi, whatever you do, meet Meher Baba, he's on the ship. Now, at the same time, Baba had to get a visa. And the British authorities insisted that Meher Baba had to sign his own visa form. And regardless of what Jamshed Mehta could do, he could not convince them otherwise. So Baba was compelled to sign his own visa. And his comment was, the British Empire is compelling me to sign its own death warrant. This will be the end of the British Empire in India. In the second trip to the West, there was that paramount newsreel. And in that, Baba dictated a statement, which was read by Charles Purdom. We've seen it many times. He said, I see the structure of all the great and recognized religions and creeds of the world tottering. The West particularly is more inclined toward the material side of things, which has from untold ages brought in its wake wars, pestilence, and financial crisis. It should not be understood that I discard and hate materialism. I mean that materialism should not be considered an end in itself, but a means to an end. He meant that the purpose of materialism was to serve spiritual need and purpose. On that same trip around the world, Baba was interviewed in America the following month, and he made these comments. Since arriving in America, I have been asked many times what solution I have brought for the social problems now confronting you. What did I have to offer that would solve the problems of unemployment, prohibition, and crime that would eliminate the strife between individuals and nations 
and pour a healing balm of peace upon a troubled world? The answer has been so simple that it has been difficult to grasp. The root of all our difficulties, individual and social, is self-interest. But the elimination of self-interest, even granting a sincere desire on the part of the individual to accomplish it, is not so easy and is never completely achieved except by the aid of a perfect master. For self-interest springs from a false idea of the true nature of the self, and this false idea must be eradicated and the truth experienced before that elimination of self-interest is possible. I intend, when I speak, to reveal the one supreme self which is in all. When this is accomplished, the idea of the self as a limited, separate entity will disappear, and with it will vanish self-interest. Cooperation will replace competition. Certainty will replace fear. Generosity will replace greed. Exploitation will disappear. Then between the trips to the West, Baba returned. He began working with the God Mad in 1936, 37. It was the Nasik Ashram with the Westerners. And then after that first ashram for the Westerners, he traveled to France. He brought the women Mondali there, the close women Mondali, and some of the men. And they stayed in Cannes for 80 days or so. That is the longest time that Bob ever spent in one place outside of India. The trip to America in 1952 was longer, but if we speak of one place, it was Cannes. The purpose of that trip to Cannes was the preparation for World War II. What's interesting about that trip is that he had the must Muhammad brought to France. And he worked with him there in France towards the end of that trip in October 1937. And Bob has worked with the spiritually advanced persons. He often said they do specific work or they represent specific countries. He explained that Muhammad Must represented Germany. And it was interesting that he brought Muhammad to France and worked with him there. The Must work continued when Baba returned to India, as did the gathering of more Westerners at Meher Retreat on the hill. Before the war, Baba wanted the women on the hill in Meher Retreat to be of both the East and the West. And a feature of that ashram during the war years was that he would rearrange groups of them to be isolated from each other, not to speak to each other except through the medium of Kitty or Katie. And from time to time, he would rearrange those groups of women during the war years there on Maribad Hill. It is that period when he ordered them to start singing the seven names of God every day for a specific time. When Meher Retreat was renovated in 1938, that rock wall was built around Meher Retreat. And on top of that rock wall was placed posts then during the war with barbed wire. It started with a certain number, and occasionally Baba would tell the Mondali to add one more strand of barbed wire. Eventually, by the end of the war, there were seven strands of barbed wire on that fence. These are all just interesting details, but it's part of the history. In 1939, Baba moved the ashram to Bangalore for some months. And while he was in Bangalore, people would visit him, and he made certain comments about the war that was starting to rev up. This is something from Lord Mayer. From the 24th of August, 1939, Baba said, In the end, there will be no victor, no vanquished. All will be crushed and exhausted, but it will usher in a new order in the world. Baba would continually comment about the war, and those near Baba observed that in his work with the Mus, the Mus's reactions would be connected with events and developments related to the war. It is also significant to note that for a few days prior to the outbreak of the war, Baba had been feeling indisposed and running a fever. But this did not stop his daily work with the musts. Baba commented, it is all an enigma 
a series of complications that will drive all crazy. No one will know what to do and how to come out of it all. To the eager desire and cry of the world, I will respond and speak. Now it sounds from a casual listener that is kind of a remedial, immediate reaction to what was happening. But often, Baba's statements during this time have to do with the period of his avataric advent, not just with a few years of the war. Here's an example again from the Bangalore ashram. On the 6th of March, 1940, Dr. Jamshed Patel of Bangalore and a Mr. Pestanji came to see Baba. In the course of conversation with them, Baba said, Although I am in seclusion and keep silence throughout, I am now very busy working internally for future developments. You will see the upheavals that will take place very soon. The war will take a very serious turn, bringing untold misery and ruination all around. And Pestenji interjected, the U.S. Under Secretary of State is trying to negotiate for peace, so let us hope that he will be successful. Smiling, Baba made a play on words, using the simile, It is like digging a well in summer. Nothing will come out of it. The world will soon plunge into the throes of a war never before seen or heard of. But Baba, what about the thousands of lives that will be lost? Pestenji asked. Can't they be saved? And Baba replied, The war is necessary. All this destruction will purge the world of dirt, cleanse it of filth, so that a new order can be established. There are millions and billions of holes in my body because of the suffering of the world, but because of my infinite bliss and power, I can withstand it. Suppose you have a boil on your finger, which is septic. You do not cut off the whole finger because of it. You bear it because the finger is part of your body. In the same way, I consider all as mine and I suffer but I do not destroy myself and slaughter all. I put up with it and suffer because all are part of my universal body. Baba began gathering more must in Bangalore. The must that came to Baba at that time was Chapti Baba. You remember he was on the sixth plane. He had an interesting habit. He liked to pour earth on his head. He also liked a lot of water, good bath. So Baba returned with the ashram to Marabad by May 1940 and established a must ashram on the hill in what had been the maternity hospital compound. They built a barricade around it, kept it secluded, and Baba kept five musts up there at the time. Chakti Baba was one of them. Krishna Nair was one of the new young Mandali at the time, and Baba ordered him to keep 15 pails of earth and Chakti Baba's little room, so that whenever he had the whim, he could grab a bucket of earth and pour it over his head. Now at this time, Baba would give Chakti Baba baths, part of his work, which required 150 to 200 pails of water per bath, and it would go on for hours. And this is at a time when he would tell Dimandali, we don't have any water, it's the end of the summer, stop taking baths. And at the same time, then, he would order 150 to 200 pails of water to bathe Chakti Baba. So imagine the importance of this to Baba. And then as soon as Chakti Baba finished his bath, he would immediately grab a pail of earth and pour it on his head and rub it in. One of those days in May, while he was pouring earth over his head, Chakti Baba remarked to Krishna Nair, his attendant, There will be much anguish and privation in the world, and many will die of starvation, but Baba will finally assuage the suffering of the world. Baba entered seclusion there in the Maribad Mastashram on June 1st, 1940, as he stated, particularly to speed up things regarding the war. On June 3rd, he explained, My speaking is largely connected with the world war and peace. Peace does not mean truce. A truce does not necessarily have to happen. A truce will not make me speak. Before the end of the war, when peace is just on the point of appearing, 
I shall speak. I shall speak just before permanent peace. There's another one of those statements that seem apparently to relate to the Second World War, but obviously it means a greater period. From his book, The Wayfarers, William Duncan wrote, On the night of 9th June, 1940, Chakti Baba became suddenly violent, noisy, and abusive, and emerged in a state of disorder and frenzy from his little room. He went directly to Baba's room and declared that his house had now been utterly destroyed and that he had come for shelter to Baba. If the remark were literal, it made no sense at all, since his little room was as it always had been, small and bare, but neat and whole, a place where he usually was happy to sit alone for hours. Baba at once gave orders for the two to be left alone and Chakti Baba for some hours was heard chattering and expostulating with Baba. Eventually he became quiet and spent the rest of the night alone with Baba. Now Baba's rooms were where the cage room is now. Those two rooms on that east end of what was built as a maternity ward in 1938 was built for Elizabeth as an office for Meher Baba Journal. Baba took those two rooms and the musts were kept in the main room and also on the extreme west room, which is where I believe Chakti Baba was staying. Continuing with William Donkin's book. The following morning, he was quieter and repaired to his own little chamber. And Baba then explained that Chakti Baba, who had a spiritual connection with France, had been overwrought with despair because of the cataclysm that was overwhelming France during these few fateful days. The reader will perhaps need reminding that the collapse of the French armies began about 5th June and that the Germans entered Paris eight days later on 13th June. So here again you have that explanation, and yes, Baba did explain that during World War II, while Muhammad the Must represented Germany, Chakti Baba in his work represented France. There were other must that also took part in this work constantly. Baba did the greater part of his work with musts during World War II. Marriage said as they would travel, there was an interesting signboard in all the railway stations because they wanted to conserve energy, conserve movement for the troops. Whenever they got on a train in India, he said, we would look up at the platform and there was that same sign wherever we went. Travel only if you must. And they were always on the must tour. So, Whenever Baba was in seclusion in the Marabad must ashram, which, by the way, is the only remaining ashram where Baba worked with musts, and now it has been returned to that condition as a museum. So whenever you go to Marabad, you can see the only remaining ashram where he worked with must, and a very important one. His work of seclusions during World War II with the must was done there. Every few days, sometimes only once a week, sometimes two days a week, Baba would go to see the women. So on June 10th, he did. Money, Kitty, Elizabeth, somebody would keep in their diary comments that Baba had made. And on that day, he commented, if Italy joins the war, there will be world war. There will be utter destruction and chaos, just as I want. Then people will feel the hollowness, the emptiness of it all, and turn to God. Since I am in India, India will suffer a great deal also. Later that same day, to the surprise of the world, Italy declared war on England and France. In July, Baba traveled to the northeast of India. He sent Kakabaria to pick up a must in Calcutta. That's Karim Baba. And at the same time, he sent word to Pendu to make that cage room at Marabad. Baba took Karim Baba to Ranchi and worked with him there. On July 5th, in 1940, in Golkati, on the way to Calcutta, Baba commented about the future after the war. 
A time will come when people will even forget the war and the terrible destruction it has caused in life and property, for there will be further disasters, more voracious in their destructive power, like plagues and pestilences, fire and famine, floods and earthquakes of immense magnitude and force, all of which will take more toll on life and property than machine guns and bombs. Then, too, civil wars will complicate the political situations among nations and make things even more chaotic until it will create a deadlock. Even millionaires will be starving for food. There will be chaos everywhere, and all will be helpless. After that many months of seclusion work at Maribad, Baba traveled again, and in the north, in March 1941, when they were in Quetta, Chati Baba made this statement. There will be so great a calamity in the world that no one can imagine it. Even brother will kill brother, and there will be great tribulation. Then all the world will think of my big brother. At that time, Baba will draw aside the veil, and all will pay obeisance to him. Baba gave a lot of messages concerning war. At the time, he was giving discourses because of Meher Baba Journal. Elizabeth agreed to do Meher Baba Journal if Baba would promise to give a discourse that they could publish in a journal. After all, that's what Baba's followers and lovers wanted to hear. So that's how we came to get the discourses. And because of World War II, Baba would give other explanations and discourses violence and nonviolence, and also because of Mahatma Gandhi's activities, Baba responded to the social need. You have the discourses, violence, nonviolence, action and inaction. Those things were given at that time. Baba also gave discourses on war. Now, if my memory serves me right, and this is a conversation I had with Erich, there was a book that was first published, I believe, in 1945. Bob had a Western follower named Alexander Markey. This is what it looks like now. I recall that this is what it looked like in the first edition, although I haven't been able to find a first edition if anybody has it. This is now an edition that was done much later by Ramkrishnan and Pune, a compilation of other things also on the subject. Here are some excerpts from Origins, and Effects of War, a discourse that is printed in Meher Baba on War. The basic causes of the social turmoil that often precipitates into war may be found in the individual, the social whole, the functioning of Maya, and in the very intent of God's will. Inasmuch as these are essentially one in the final analysis, this means no more than that war is part of the divine pattern. Insofar as war affects the individual, however, it must be understood at all the levels within illusion from which it is precipitated. The first is the level of the individual himself. It may be readily seen that most persons are immersed in their own egos and selfish viewpoints. This is the life of illusory values in which man is caught. If man were to face the truth, he would understand that all life is one, and in this understanding, forget the limiting self. But man does not face the truth regarding himself as separate from and competing with the rest of mankind. This attitude often breeds a concept of personal happiness that creates lust for power, unbridled greed, and unrelieved hatred. Ignorant of the real purpose of life, Many persons sink to the lowest level of culture, burying themselves in and contributing to the decay of forms lingering on from the dead past. Bound by material interest and a limited viewpoint, they forget their divine destiny. They have truly lost their way, and so they lay savagely about themselves, for their hearts are torn by fear and hate. The second level from which wars are bred is that of the social whole. Here, 
economic pressures are often cited as a major cause. Also, resistance to aggression seems a reasonable cause. It would be an illusion within illusion, however, to claim that wars arise merely to secure material adjustment. They are more often the products of uncritical identification with narrow interests, which through association finally come to be regarded as one's sole rights. Economic adjustment cannot be divorced from a spiritual context. Economic adjustment can be achieved only as people realize there can be no planned cooperative action in economic matters without the replacing of self-interest with self-giving love. Failing this fundamental requisite, the attainment of highest efficiency in production will only lead to a further sense of insufficiency in new conflict. A profound spirit of self-giving love must underlie all effort to solve and remove the economic pressures leading towards war. It may be readily seen then that a solution to the individual and social factors underlying war rests upon the spiritual enlightenment of the individual. This need not mean that wars are inevitable as long as the ego self of the individual continues to ride rampant in the cultural and economic areas of life. For war is only the most explosive gross manifestation of the combined egocentricity of mankind. But conflict of one sort or another is inevitable until the ego self is finally tamed and eliminated. As man faces the truth and begins to appreciate that all humanity, all creation, is one, the problem of wars will commence to disappear. Wars must be so clearly seen by all to be both unnecessary and unreasonable that the immediate problem will not be to stop wars, but to wage them spiritually against the attitude of mind which generated them. In the light of the truth of the unity of all, a cooperative and harmonious life becomes inevitable. Thus, the chief task for those who set out to rebuild humanity after a great war is to do their utmost to dispel the spiritual ignorance that envelops humanity. The disease of selfishness in mankind will need a cure that is not only universal in application, but drastic in nature. Selfishness is so deep-rooted that it can be eradicated only by being attacked from all sides. Real peace and happiness will dawn spontaneously when selfishness is purged. The peace and happiness that come from self-giving love are permanent. Even the worst sinner can become a great saint if he has the courage and sincerity to invite a drastic and complete change of heart. The third level from which war springs is that of Maya. When truly understood, all conflicts and wars are seen to be a part of the divine game. They are a result of the divine will, which finds manifested expression in the world of forms through the medium of Maya, the cosmic power that causes the illusory world of duality to appear as real. The purpose served by Maya is twofold. One, it can be instrumental in trapping the mind in the duality of illusion. And two, it can also be instrumental in freeing the mind from the grip of spiritual ignorance and bondage. Maya should not be ignored. It must be handled with detachment and understanding. Wars are the work of Maya and are either spiritually disastrous or beneficial, depending on whether they are based on attachment to or detachment from the hold of Maya. The final level from which the causes of war spring is no level at all, for it is a part of the divine plan of God to give to a hungry and weary world a fresh dispensation of the eternal and only truth. During war, great forces of destruction are afoot, which at times might seem to be dominant, but constructive forces for the redemption of humanity are also released through various channels. 
though the working of these latter forces is largely silent, eventually they are bound to bring about the transformations that will render safe and steady the further spiritual progress of humanity. Regardless of the political and economic factors described by historians as they look at war in retrospect, from the spiritual point of view, this sanguine phenomenon is a cyclic divine ferment over which no earthly power has control. Continuing in the same vein, this has been included in the book Meher Baba on War. When Baba was in Nagpur in November of 1944, he gave this message. However dark the clouds and whatever may be the poignancy of pain and despair, one spiritual fact embodying cheer and hope to suffering humanity must not be lost sight of and which I am going to convey to you here today. There are always two aspects of divinity perpetually and eternally active in the affairs of the world. The destructive aspect of divinity, as expressed in Persian Shama i Jalal, which means self-glorification, and the constructive aspect of divinity called in Persian Shama i Jamal, meaning self-beatitude. When this aspect of self-glorification by God becomes palpably active, it entails suffering and destruction on a colossal scale. When the aspect of divine self-beatitude asserts itself, it brings in its wake peace and plenty. In the aspect of self-glorification, divinity repels itself through its own creation. And in the aspect of self-beatitude, divinity attracts or loves itself through its own creation. The former is a negative method and the latter a positive one. And both these methods ultimately are instruments of divine wisdom to arouse humanity to the divine heritage, which is self-realization. Further, both the aspects of God referred to not only affect humanity individually and collectively, but their intensity and force are directly in proportion to each other as they assert themselves in cyclic waves. Now that the destructive phase is about to weaken, the aspect of divine beatitude is nearly due to come into force. And to invite humanity to avail themselves of this blessedness to come is my divine mission in life. As in the present world catastrophe, even the guilty and not guilty, the combatants and non-combatants have suffered intensely physically and mentally. Similarly, in the self-beatitude aspect of God that is to be manifest in the near future, not only the deserving, but the non-deserving as well, have as good a chance of being the recipients of divine grace, provided they are wide awake to the situation, which will be a cyclic dispensation, rare and unique. My blessings to all those who have heard my message and those who have not. Padre told us that Baba had explained that the two most tenacious mediums through which the ego mind expresses itself are nationality and religion. And the three ways that the ego expresses itself are like this. I am right. I and mine are preferred over others. I and mine have a right to live Others, not so much. And that results in war. The war ended. Naya Maharaj dropped his body, I think, on September 2nd. The next day, the final surrender of the Japanese happened. So with the completion of World War II, it was a completion of not only Baba's five, he was the last of Baba's five perfect masters to drop his body, he was also the last of the 55 perfect masters that Baba indicates since the first perfect age that happened during the time of Muhammad, the prophet. So from the time that Naya Maharaj dropped his body regarding perfect ages, it was in the next advent. But Baba made this comment after World War II ended. It still wasn't enough. So within a few weeks, 
he went to north central India, a place called Angirish Rishi Hill, where Jal Karawala, his disciple, was, who arranged a seclusion for him there. The Must Bachi, Ali Shah, was brought from Marabad to take part in that seclusion there. Adi told us that after that seclusion was done, Baba emerged from his seclusion hut. And this is what many of the Mandali have said who were close to Baba whenever he did seclusion work. He was perspiring, a bit flushed, but his hair would stand up like there was static electricity. It was a typical feature of Baba's seclusion work. And Baba seemed exhausted, but Adi said this is the first time to him that Baba spelled on the board. Three quarters of the world will have to be destroyed. That, of course, was repeated in the final declaration. Baba also mentioned it again, incidentally, in 1947 at one point. During July of 1946, Baba was touring North India, contacting musts and other spiritually advanced persons again, and they contacted a great yogi of the fifth plane. His name was Jala Tapasvi. Jala is a Hindi word meaning like the stream, water, flowing water. Tapas is penance, austerity. He was a great yogi who wore a green kafni and sat on the roof of a ruined temple which had once stood on an island in the Ganges River, but it was now submerged, only the top was sticking out, and Jala Tapasvi would stay up there on the top of that temple in the middle of the river. When Kakabariya and Erich first went to him, they introduced themselves as Parsis from Bombay, and Jaltapaswi at once asked, how are things there? There are constant riots and disturbances, Erich replied. Jaltapaswi surprised them by stating, it is natural and indeed inevitable. It is all the work of the avatar who is now in form. Erich asked, how can we find the avatar? No one knows him, the yogi said but he is already born. I know it. He moves amongst humanity incognito, unknown. People like Gandhi, the great men of the world, the so-called leaders, may be famous and even worshipped by mankind, but they are mere playthings in the hands of the avatar. They are like kites, the strings of which are held firmly in the avatar's grasp, and he controls them as he wishes. Hitler shook the world, everyone says so, but it is the avatar who worked through him. Erich asked, when will the avatar manifest? After 22 years, which meant after 1968. These wars and disturbances will continue until then, and three quarters of humanity will be wiped out. This Narak Wasi, Narak means hell, Wasi is like, this hell-like world will continue, and then a swargawasi, heaven-like world, will be born. For how can people of hell coexist with the residents of heaven? 75% of the present world will perish, and the remaining one-fourth will be absorbed in the qualities of a new world where peace and happiness will reign. So here's another indication that people in the mental world were aware of things that others weren't. He didn't know anything about Baba's seclusion work on Angiris Rishi Hill, where Baba had stated that. Jal Tapasvi concluded, like other avatars before him, he will be ridiculed by the majority of people, and his real fame will only spread after his death when he is recognized and worshipped as the savior. As usual, Erich and Kaka had not once referred to Meher Baba, but when Jala Tapaswi later saw Baba in a house in Rishikesh, he cried out, The Avatar has come! Baba was happy with the contact. At the beginning of March 1947, Baba sent this message to his lovers in America, conveyed by a letter to Narina and Elizabeth. The world is now drawing very close to the great upheaval which must precede the breaking of my silence. This upheaval will entail great suffering to humanity, 
but this very suffering will work a profound change of heart and will sweep the world clean for the new and vital phase that must follow. In February of 47, the British Prime Minister issued what was called a white paper relating to Indian independence, stating its plans to completely withdraw from the country by June and hand over power to any existing central government and state provinces. So that officially happened by August of 1947. And Baba made this comment a few times. The result will be that India will be divided into 56 parts, not two parts. There will be long drawn out skirmishes between the different parties, which will last 156 years. That's going into the 22nd century early before it all gets settled. In 1949, the year of the great change, Baba did that what was then called the great seclusion at Marazad of 40 days, which was a preparation for the new life. That seclusion ended on August 1st, and the new life meeting started a few weeks later. In the interim, Baba traveled to Pune and visited his brothers and other close lovers there. On August 5th at Bindra House in Pune, Baba was in an expansive mood. And in the course of conversation, he remarked about the current world political climate. The peace movements are trying to prevent a world war. The pacts and alliances on both sides, America and Russia, seek to balance the world powers. These are all activities to extinguish the possibility of war. But out of sheer desperation, just like a cat locked up in an enclosed room, the forces of war will gather themselves, attack civilization, strangle and destroy it. Baba spent most of the year 1953 in Dehradun, continuing his work of contacting the poor and afflicted and must and other spiritually advanced persons. At the same time, the Korean War was coming to an end. It was not a truce even. It was just a ceasefire. It all has only ever been a ceasefire. So Baba was making comments during that time. I'll give you some of the published comments and some of the unpublished comments. On July 31st, commenting about the world situation, if there is a war and atom bombs are used, all nations will be affected. There will be floods and earthquakes, and no remedy can be suggested for such calamities. It is said that atom bombs can create widespread earthquakes. In the case of atomic warfare, there is a possibility of the Earth's outer crust cracking. As a result of the experiments of testing the atom and hydrogen bomb, a whole island disappeared within five minutes. This happened because the origin of matter is gas. I have written about it in my book. When matter is vaporized, space and gas have three factors. The world, many millions of years old, can be destroyed in seven days. How long lasting is this world? And how many times has it been formed? and wiped out. Many a world has gone and this too will go. To take its place, another world is being made ready. Three-fourths of it is already ready. One-fourth remains to be formed. If this world is destroyed today, evolution will start in another. Evolution consists of a fixed process of ages, Stone Age, Vegetable Age, Worm Age, and so forth. If this world is destroyed today, an interval will remain, but by natural processes, new life in a new world will take millions of years to materialize. Millions of years are required for another world to come into being. Natural and unnatural catastrophes come in cycles of time, not in ages. A cycle is made up of so many ages. Just as after four years, a leap year occurs and a day is added for calculation purposes instead of adding a fraction of a day monthly, similarly, this destruction will mean leaping millions of years. There is no question of time. Millions of years mean one second, because there is nothing such as time. Baba's comments on atomic warfare were particularly timely. As 12 days later, Russia exploded its first hydrogen bomb. 
During that same period, Baba made these remarks to the Mandalik present, which are unpublished, but told to some of us, talking about this Cold War between Russia and America. Baba would speak, you know, with very articulate gestures. So he had a gesture for America, which was eagle, and then he had a gesture for Russia, which was the bear. He said, this tension between the eagle and the bear will go on for many years. But at a certain point, people will think it's resolved, it's over, but it won't be. And then it will continue and grow again. And in the end, the eagle and the bear will be like two great wrestlers in the world arena in a fight to the death. And when it's all over, one, the eagle will have its back broken, but eventually it will recover. The other, however, the bear will be mortally wounded, never to rise again. This comment about America having its back broken was something that Baba indicated at least as early as the 30s. And Baba having the accident in America with Mara, it's an indication of a great intention for the spiritual transmutation of America. And that will require suffering. The final declaration happened. You know what he said there. Time went on. The second accident, Baba talked about the black cloud gathering. In 1958, he gave his universal message. Remember the universal message? He ends by saying, all this world chaos and confusion was inevitable, and no one is to blame. What had to happen has happened. What has to happen will happen. There was and is no way out except through my coming in your midst. I had to come and I have come. I am the ancient one. So in the future, nobody can say he didn't tell us. The fact is nobody paid attention. Duncan wrote the book, The Wayfarers, and he told of five what he called favorite musts of Baba. But this truly, we could say, was Baba's last favorite must. His name was Nilkantawala, who Baba first contacted in Dehradun in 1953, and subsequently through the years, occasionally had him brought to Pune and Marasad. So Nilkantawala was brought to Marasad for Baba's work in 1958, and then there was a period of months of seclusion after that. So he had Nilkantawala brought to Marasad for that work by Amr's father Kumar. When Kumar brought Nilkantamala to Marisad on July 6th, Nilkantamala was keeping silence. But on July 10th, while Baba was giving his universal message at the meeting in Marabad, the must broke his silence and began talking, sometimes nonstop, in three languages at the same time. The Mandali could understand little of what he uttered. One short sentence they were able to decipher was, the world is zero and in it is God. From July 23rd, Nilkantwala again began observing silence, using a slate and chalk to communicate, writing in English, Hindi, Bengali, and Urdu. But four days later, on the 27th, he began to talk and once remarked, the bombs will fall in the north, south, and all directions. The man-made world will finish, and God-made world will revive. He used to cook his own food with Baidu's help at Marisad. And while cooking, Nilkant would talk to himself, but he once uttered prophetically in Hindi, a black cloud is gathering and people will scatter like wild beasts. The earth will split. Men will become helpless and shelterless like beasts roaming on a plateau. People will die in large numbers, but will then take birth again. Due to forced circumstances, people will be compelled to eat grass and leaves. Old human habitations will be wiped out and new ones will be established. The place of the indigenous languages like Hindi will be replaced by the English language. Rites, rituals and religious ceremonies will be eliminated. His comment about English is interesting, as if you recall, for the last year and a half at Marisad, 
Bob ordered his mandali to speak in English. Even people like Nadja, who didn't at the time know it very well. And in the 60s, Francis was one of the newer mandali then. And since he was new, he thought it was particularly important to record Baba's comments, which were always interesting. So we came up with the book, The Everything and the Nothing. This is a great essay from that book, Forgive and Forget. Baba says, people ask God for forgiveness, but since God is everything and everyone, who is there for him to forgive? Forgiveness of the created was already there in his act of creation. But still people ask God's forgiveness, and he forgives them. But they, instead of forgetting that for which they ask forgiveness, forget that God has forgiven them, and instead remember the things they were forgiven, and so nourish the seed of wrongdoing, and it bears its fruit again. Again and again they plead for forgiveness, and again and again the Master says, I forgive. But it is impossible for men to forget their wrongdoings, and the wrongs done to them by others. And since they cannot forget, they find it hard to forgive. But forgiveness is the best charity. It is easy to give the poor money and goods when one has plenty, but to forgive is difficult. But it is the best thing if one can do it. Instead of men trying to forgive one another, they fight. Once they fought with their hands and with clubs, then with spears and bows and arrows, then with guns and cannon. Then they invented bombs and carriers for them. Now they have developed missiles that can destroy millions of others thousands of miles away, and they are prepared to use them. The weapons used change, but the aggressive pattern of man remains the same. Now men are planning to go to the moon and the first to get there will plant his nation's flag on it. And that nation will say, it is mine. But another nation will dispute the claim, and they will fight here on this earth for possession of that moon. And whoever goes there, what will he find? Nothing but himself. And if people go on to Venus, they will still find nothing but themselves. Whether men soar to outer space or dive to the bottom of the deepest ocean, they will find themselves as they are, unchanged, because they will not have forgotten themselves nor remembered to exercise the charity of forgiveness. Supremacy over others will never cause a man to find a change in himself. The greater his conquest, the stronger is his confirmation of what his mind tells him, that there is no God other than his own power and he remains separated from God, the absolute power. But when the same mind tells him that there is something which may be called God, and further, when it prompts him to search for God, that he may see him face to face, he begins to forget himself and to forgive others for whatever he has suffered from them. And when he has forgiven everyone and has completely forgotten himself, he finds that God has forgiven him everything, and he remembers who, in reality, he is. About this future time, Baba commented once, Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But now I say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what will happen. So all those years, Baba kept silent. And the end was coming. He gave hints. The Mandali were at their wit's end as to what to do. Duncan was there on that last morning of January 31st at Marisad. Money was in the room. And Baba saw that they were just at their wit's end. But Baba was very happy about what had happened. And that's when he told Money and Duncan, imagine all of this was just for that one word. One other detail about the story of the eagle and the bear was that Baba said, it will go on for years and everybody will think now it's resolved. And when the Soviet Union dissolved, it seemed to me, yes, that's what he means when he said, it will seem like it's all over, but it won't be. And what I forgot to tell you is that 
he said, then incidents will happen in a certain place. And in the end, the two will be like two great wrestlers in the world arena. And it seems that that is what is happening now. And for a narcissistic sociopath like Vladimir Putin, he can't back down. But it will go on and on, and eventually, whatever happens, he most likely will feel that he has to push the button. That's what I see. That's my speculation. So let's go to questions. Scott Tower. Hi, Scott. I heard once many years ago in Mondeley Hall, I don't remember exactly the context or the, who was speaking, but I think it was reporting the Mondeley asking Baba with him there, Baba, how much will your lovers be affected by this destruction in the world? And it may have been Mani, I can't remember exactly who it was, but he said that Baba held up his fingers like this. And they were relieved because the implication was that Baba's close lovers would be protected by him or spared something by him. I'm just wondering if you ever heard anything like this or if you have any comment relative to all the other things you've been sharing with us. You reminded me of another point, and that is what I heard directly from Mara. Remember how Mara would reminisce and sometimes she would then remembering something that would happen with Baba and she would close her eyes and reminisce. And she was recalling the statement where Baba said things in the world in the future would get so bad that people would have to eat the bark off the trees and the whole world would be starving. Mara had her eyes closed like this and she said, but Baba said, but wherever my lovers are in the world, I will make sure that they have something. So they keep going on. So that was specifically about the issue of food and starvation? Yes. Yeah. I'll give you another example. Fred Winterfeld was one of the attendees of the Three Incredible Weeks, and he was there on the last day at the final declaration meeting. Baba declared the destruction of three quarters of the world. So that was a hot topic during those years. When Baba traveled to the West the next time, 1956, I believe, is when Fred asked Baba this question. So with all this calamity that's about to occur, isn't there some preparation we should do? Should we move to the Himalayas in a cave and take canned food there? What should we do? Baba said, even the Himalayas are going to crumble to dust. When the time comes, it won't matter where you are. It will only matter who you are. Which, obviously, from the divine perspective, looking into creation, it's all dictated by the law of karma, which in creation is the manifestation of God's will. So, of course, it won't matter where you are. It will only matter who you are. I did ask Bob a question once about three quarters of the world destruction. How can we be sure to be included in the destruction of three quarters of the world? You don't have any choice. <laughs> Not so easy to get out. Judy Robertson. Hi, Peter. Could you elaborate more on basically your last comments of the lecture itself? Why and what circumstances you think will unfold from here that would end up with Putin deciding he needs to, as I think you put it, push the button. And what happens after that, etc. What happens before and what happens after? Archetypally, in the world, there have to be two major powers that represent that antagonism. The whole creation begins through antagonism, as Baba said, the clash between Pran and Akash, which is the primal antagonism. And that reverberates through creation. The antagonism between nothing and nothing causes an apparent something, which is an illusion, but an illusion with purpose, because ultimately the purpose is consciousness. This plays out through creation to the very end, and now we're faced with this big archetypal conflict. That's the overview spiritually now, getting to the nuts and bolts of the situation. 
during Baba's lifetime, we saw this all play out. Europe was the big field. And remember one thing that Bob used to say during World War II, before even he would say, Russia holds the key. Nadine told story, one of his disciples was Russian, and he would say, Nadine holds the key. Now this could be interpreted in two ways. At the time, Russia did hold the key because Germany invaded Russia, the Soviet Union, went almost all the way to Moscow. Then they were faced with that Russian winter, which they were unprepared for. And gradually the Russians totally ate the Germans. The vast majority of the war was in the East. It wasn't in the West. In our Western history, it was Western centric. It was focused upon what did our country do and what did our allies do and all that. But most of the death occurred in Russia and the East many more times than what happened in the West. More than including the Holocaust? Much more. There were 21 million Russians who died, 22 million Russians wow. who died in World War II, something like that. And Stalin was unconcerned about that. He didn't even play the game of POWs. His policy came out that if Russian soldiers don't die in battle, if they are taken as prisoners, they have no more motherland. Simple. Just assume them. That's all they had to do. There are many more where they came from. Keep sending them. Baba made those comments about the world leaders at the time and about Stalin. He said he was just pure intellect. No heart, pure intellect. Could be considered psychopathic. He was paranoid and murdered so many people around him. Putin continues to murder people who are opposed to him. They have accidents. They die of food poisoning or they have mysterious falls from their hotels. Things like that happen. But as Baba termed, the anti-God forces. For narcissistic sociopaths, there is no truth. There is only what you can convince or persuade people to believe in and follow. And if you repeatedly assert something with self-assurance, that means you have the quality to do that. That's what the truth is. Because really speaking, there is no truth. There is no God to them. Besides, as Baba said, their own power. But this has to be, these people have to play that archetypal role as the leaders of nations. So it happens like that. What we see in Ukraine now is that megalomania of Putin to invade Ukraine and say it really never was a country. Those people are really just second-class Russian citizens. It's not what the Ukrainians wanted to hear, not at all. But he thought the West was weak and in a position that they would go along with it rather than be forced to endure any discomfort. But the response to that, regardless of the political chaos in America, the response to that was overwhelmingly to side with Ukraine, who turns out to be the hero. But it's going on and on. Now, helpful for Russia, they're clearing their prisons out and sending their convicted criminals to fight the war. More sociopaths who will do the bidding, more sociopathic cruelty. But in the end, there is a law of karma. But an escalation continues to happen there. Everything that Putin thought would be over by now isn't, but he still has confidence that he can do something. On the other hand, he has no way out because of his nature. He can never say, wow, that was stupid. Why did I do that? He could never say such a thing. There's no such thing as conscience involved. There is egomania, megalomania. That is the driving force. So archetypally, a whole nation regardless of what the majority of Russian people feel. They're stuck in that. So God knows how long this will go on. I don't think there is any way out, though. Unless Putin is taken out by his own people, there's no way out. But it seems to me, since you've asked, I would say that inevitably he'll be forced in a corner of his own making, and he'll realize that he can't win but he's going to try and make sure that the West doesn't win. Mm -hmm. And that means he'll preemptively do a nuclear strike. 
this is speculation on my part based upon what I've seen and heard through the years. What will the results be? But that's only one thing. Okay. That's only one thing. That's not three quarters of the world being destroyed. Because Baba said the majority of the destruction would be from natural causes. But he also hinted that natural causes can be triggered by man-made causes, specifically nuclear weapons exploding at specific places on the Earth's crust, causing reactions. Humanity has this mentality that this is real. Our world is solid. It's real. It's rock after all. But it's, as Baba said, it's nothing but gas, consolidated gas in the end. If we take a picture of the Earth from a distance, now consider the surface of the Earth. The diameter is about 8,000 miles. From sea level, the largest height will be, let's say, Mount Everest, which is not six miles. And the deepest point, Mariana's Trench, only one point, not, say, seven miles. So at the extreme edges of the Earth, there's only a discrepancy of 13 miles. 8,000 miles in diameter divided by 13, which is the extreme discrepancy of the Earth's crust. It's not much, is it? So moving that Earth's crust a few thousand feet here and there, up and down, that undulation is nothing. It's just a little movement. But I believe that a lot of man-made destruction will have to happen first so that humanity realizes that it's our responsibility we messed up. In this avataric age are all of these factors that contribute to an environment where all of this can come to a head on all fronts. And on all fronts, things are like tottering dominoes ready to fall. The increase of technology, increase in science and health, allowing that People don't die as easily as they used to, so there's longevity. And there's also the spiritual side of that, an urge for people to be born on Earth during this important avatar period, even if they're not aware of it, to get that chance, even subconsciously, to be in the environment, the atmosphere of the avatar's advent. So the population grows and grows, Baba once commented. Do your best or do nothing at all the population will increase. All of these things exacerbate the conditions that will ultimately lead to catastrophes. Humanity has been stuck in its patterns of tribalism and competition. And then suddenly technology improves in a few centuries. But this mentality of tribalism has not necessarily improved. So while technology has improved, transportation, communication, all of these things, instead of people realizing we don't have to compete like this, let's just cooperate and make things practical. They can't get over self-interest, can't get over tribalism. They can't get over the us and them, can't get into oneness. So the only answer, unfortunately, is suffering. So what humanity thinks is reality has to be not totally destroyed, but severely shaken so that humanity will come to terms with that. So I believe that the first part has to be results of man-made mistakes so that humanity cannot deny it, has to face the fact that it's not just a random occurrence. It is due to our own mistakes. And what is the time frame? Time frame is a different issue. Last year for the Legacy, I did a presentation on the importance of the four messages, five messages regarding manifestation. Right. And you'll recall that the last thing was called the final decision, where Baba said his decision was to keep the impact of all the necessary changes. But in order that humanity could tolerate that impact, he decided to extend the time element. In his compassion, he decided to extend the time element. That being said, I believe there is a window. And specifically, that window is in 
a century that follows the avatar's dropping of his body. When he dropped his body, it was the release of his lifetime of work, really the release of his lifetime of work. And it's important to remember that since we are not living in reality, we regard time and space as real, but that time is a plastic thing. Time manifested in our creation is going to be, according to him, stretched out. I believe in the inner world, it's already happening, but in this world, we're seeing a great catharsis. All of these things are happening to bring out things, manifest falseness, because before the truth can manifest, all this falseness has to be expressed. Falseness is always there, loud and noisy and making a lot of commotion, and that hides the truth, which is always there behind it silently undisturbed but humanity gets distracted by the noise and the commotion and it's so insidious the only answer is oneness that's what baba continually expressed but it can't be done by human beings and every, oh, pardon you say the century after baba century, because you know baba used that term we know Baba said he would come again in 700 years, means a short span. So when the Avataric Advent is a short span between the next one, there is a roughly one century period of grace after he drops his body. If, as in the day of Muhammad, it's a long term, a 1400 year span, then it's a two century period. When the flowering of the Avatar culture happens, so I believe, because Baba said this, but he also said this, his first circle, all have to get realization within that 100-year period. The subsequent circles are spread out until the next advent. But the first circle must have realization within that first period. And of those first circle people, he said some of them would be perfect masters. And no doubt they will be persons who are executing this work, this manifestation, even this catharsis, no, we don't know. We don't know. But this is based upon Baba's explanations, not just conjecture on my part. Mayor Prasad? I have a short comment and a question. Mm -hmm. You know, during the India's freedom movement, there was a British officer, General Dyer, who had massacred men, women, and children. And he was against Gandhi. And Baba said that General Dyer would be one of Gandhi's inner circle when Gandhi becomes a perfect master. So, you know, it's hard to tell the roles that all these people play and their inner readiness. The question I have is, in your talk, you mentioned something that I haven't heard before, perfect age that started during Muhammad's time. Can you elaborate on that, please? I just point you to God Speaks, the supplement of God Speaks, where Baba had explained that there are 11 perfect ages between avatars. And in each perfect age, there are five perfect masters. And when the avatar comes again, that number is 56. So that number 56, that perfect number happens again. Oh, I see. But this is an overview. Some of us had looked closely at this and said, something with this doesn't make sense especially in the long periods. We know that some of these perfect masters didn't live hundreds and some years, but some did, but mostly we don't see that. Baba did in the later years say that there were parts of God Speaks he wanted to rework and he wanted Francis to work on that. One of the specific points was about the perfect masters and their ages and how that happens. We can make conjectures about that, but that would be in this meeting a digression. So we won't digress. But going back to the other important point, what you say is very true. Ultimately, this is beyond good and evil. I'll give you some examples. The avatar circle people have to play important roles in the preparation for the next advent. We're not talking about the ones who were in the circle during the avatar's advent because they're in the circle until they drop their bodies. We're talking about people who are being prepared to be in the circle. 
in the case of the first circle, they are in the circle when they live these things. I'll give you a couple of examples. Bob uh, indicated that his close disciple Vishnu, one of the members of his first circle, had been Napoleon in his previous life. Napoleon played that very important role of shaping modern Europe for this next advent. And Europe, of course, became that ground of play for two world wars and what's happening now. And Napoleon was proud and had different traits that you wouldn't consider to be a, a great spiritual person. But that has nothing to do with it. When the members of the circle are formed, they contain certain traits. And the perfect masters who develop them and bring them along make sure that they have those sense scars that can be used by the avatar, by the perfect masters, in the execution of the divine plan during the period between the avataric advents. They don't have parabha anymore. All of their sanskars have been transmuted in the first circle into vijnani sanskars, sanskars of the threshold of the path. So their ticket is already punched, but they're playing their roles out, and the avatar uses their makeup as archetypes in his divine work. So Vishnu was the polling. Baba said, Korshid was Queen Victoria. I'm going to say something that's a little shocking, but it probably should be said in context so that people can get an understanding. Baba's brother Adi Jr. said that Baba said that Baidul had been Genghis Khan. He was one of the great butchers in history. Baidul himself strong person, strong personality, great dignity. But as one of the members of the avatar circle with his sanskaras being transmuted, the thing is that karmic debt doesn't go on to them. They are puppets in the hands of the perfect masters. That's what has to be remembered. In the world of organized religion, you have good and evil and, and nothing can go outside of good and evil. And there's the devil who's the adversary of God. And that's the end of it. And that's false. It's false. For in reality, there is only God. Those are difficult roles to play. But they're played by the avatar circle sometimes. Baba mentioned Hitler. He said Hitler was mad. I'll give you a good example. Here's a good comparison of personalities. Baba said Hitler was mad. But he also explained that it takes the perfect masters many lifetimes to prepare a soul like Hitler to play that role. There has to be many lifetimes of an overabundance of good sense cars so that that rebound can happen. And regarding the German army, Baba said this about them, something that's not published. He said those German officers who obeyed their orders, murdered people, and went to their deaths by hanging with courage, would be liberated upon death because they played their roles honestly. Why is that? Padre explained it to me like this. He said, when the perfect master sees that soul who has collected so many sanskaras, it is like a ripe fruit on a tree that cannot be resisted. It must be plucked and harvested. So what happens to those sanskars in the hands of the perfect master? All those sanskars they collected when they get liberated are gone. That's the real way that the divine plan progresses humanity. It's a very difficult concept for people with social and religious mentality to grasp. So an interesting comparison I was saying is this. Baba said about Hitler, he was mad. He had the whole nation of Germany under a state of mass psychosis because of his charismatic madness. But he had conviction in what he was doing. And the ironic thing is, because he was convinced 
that what he was doing was for the best, all those sanskaras didn't stick to him. He was a madman. He was a psychopath, as opposed to a sociopath who doesn't care if it's good or bad. He just wants his own thing. Cheryl? Um, Hi, Cheryl. It always struck me when Erich would say in Mondeley Hall that the, all the bombing that occurred during World War II fractured the structure of society so that something new would come up. And, you know, that that whole structure of society at that time had to be broken apart. But in looking at it over the years, I thought, well, Baba, so what's changed is the structure of the royalty and the domination of a royal king or emperor or whatever was destroyed. But now we have the corporate royalists. We have the people who are doing just as much, if not more, of that insidious structure that's creating the peasants at the bottom and the power mongers and the holders of all the wealth at the top. So what really has changed? That's true. Bob had made the comment in the early years, the only kings and queens left will be the ones in the decks of cards. Okay, the system has changed. But after all, the world is nothing but selfishness. So in a dishonest world, there will be clever people who find a way around fulfilling self-interest. It's the way it is. It can be one thing or another, but ultimately the problem is selfishness. So a system, a governmental system, will never be the answer. It can never be the answer. The only answer, as Baba said, is a real change of heart. That's it. You know. They serve a great purpose, all of these people. They harvest sanskaras en masse from humanity by cheating, lying, hurting, of course, their own selfish interests. This is the way they take sanskaras. Next question. J. Baba Peter, sorry to bring some cheerfulness into this conversation. What? I, I know, I know. It's really, it's inappropriate. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to start with something specific specific and then kind of more general and let you take it where you want. Because I've been thinking about the women on the hill and we've all heard the stories of Monty having to practice shooting or Margaret training the buys in self-defense. And when I was talking to Jeff Wolverton, he told me a story that I had never heard. He said that Mara had told Jeff that Baba said the souls from um, World War II that were in the concentration camps passed, they came to the hill. And it was the time that the women were singing the seven names of God and that Mara said that these souls came here. And so that, it's like the specific of my more general question, which is, you know, we're talking about all of like the the war, the destruction, and that leading to the birth of the new humanity, right? Basically, that's what we're talking about. And I just wonder if from your reading, you have a sense, did Baba give any kind of indication, whether it's all at once, or if there's like cracks of light that come through sooner. And there are like I'm not going to say gradual because I don't mean it that way, but there could be step functions or there could be just places where light comes through first, or if it is just from your readings all at once. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have two points. The first one regarding those people who died during World War II, Baba from the early conversations with people about the coming war, would say, yes, it'll be horrible like nothing before, millions will die, but they will be the recipients of the period of peace and prosperity that is to come. And Erich told us that he felt that so many of people who were coming from the West, remember now in the late 60s, early 70s, all these people started coming to Baba and they started coming to India Erich said he felt that so many of them were people who had suffered and died in the concentration camp in World 
World War II or in the war. But they were, they played roles in that. Our friend Gary Kleiner just died this last year. If you knew him, he was my roommate at Maribond for some years. Though we were somewhat different natures, we got along fine. To me, he is an example of a person who suffered and died in the concentration camps in the previous war. It's my hunch because of what I knew of him and I saw of him. People would see this guy, he just seems to be having a rap and he's doing his thing and he doesn't really seem to be doing anything and yet he's living. People would say, how does he get away? How does he have He must have paid for it in the past. And now he experiences this privilege in this lifetime because he paid some price in the past. That's what I believe happened with him. I see that with many people. The important thing to remember is we think these lives are so real, but it's not a blip on the screen. I'm going to give you an example. Recently, I asked Ward in an email because I wanted a simile to allow people to get a perspective of the enormity of what human existence is. I said, now, I know you have the ability to tell me how many words are in God Speaks. Can you now tell me how many letters are in God Speaks? So he says, interesting you ask, because I just have the ability to do that. There are X amount of words, and there are X amount of letters and spaces. Not only letters, but the spaces between letters. And that ups up to 700 and some thousand and something. I said, okay, now if we divide 8,400,000 by that amount, how many do we have? So it's like this. Let's take the title, God Speaks. Take the O in the middle of God. Divide that O in quarters, then divide it in eighths, then divide it in sixteenths. It still doesn't add up to 8,400,000. So if it's 17 roughly lifetimes per letter in space and God speaks per human lifetime of reincarnation. How vast is that? So how is it that we give so much importance to one lifetime? Yet Baba has stated that this period is the end of a cycle of cycles. And spiritually speaking, it is very important and a great opportunity. So we try to become aware of all that. But that's the vastness of 8,400,000 lifetimes. I remember a comment Eric used to make, especially the Westerners. People would come and take things so seriously. This is this and that is that. These people are doing this. And what should we do? And Eric just looked and said, why do you people take all of this so seriously? So there's that balance, that fine line. We take responsibility most seriously, but the results of it, it's, what can we say? We're only doing our best. He wants us to be honest and responsible, and that we have to take very seriously. But the rest of it, does this dispensation of light and truth happen in dribs and drabs? Or does it happen suddenly? The answer is actually both. For those who are prepared or are becoming prepared, it happens in bits, increments. As this catharsis goes on and falseness dissipates, then light, truth comes through more and more. But ultimately, as Baba declared, there will be a tipping point in the universe when desperation through suffering becomes so extreme that humanity and one voice will cry out, enough, enough. He said only then will he break his silence. And that will be, according to him, a major dispensation of universal spiritual wisdom. There were many things that hit me, but one that was really interesting was this part about forgiveness. 
and the relationship to selfishness. And I just wanted you to comment some more on that. And then the other one, which to me wasn't as important, but it might be, that one quarter of the world is still left, how did you put it? That all but one quarter had already been prepared for the next world. So those two points. Okay, so there are two different issues here, not to be confused with three quarters of destruction. The next world in line is already three quarters prepared and only one quarter remains to be prepared for when that becomes the next planet in line. Remember Baba said that in this whole universe, there are 18,000 planets with human life on them. But to me, one of the most startling statements of Baba is that he said, but only on this earth is it possible for a human being to reach a balance between heart and mind, heart is spiritual mind, heart and intellectual mind, so that spiritual advancement can happen. It is the planet where the spiritual hierarchy resides, that is the functioning spiritual hierarchy, that does the execution of the divine plan. That's, statistically, it's a shocking thing. It's, it's really quite an amazing thing. When we lived in the trust compound, I didn't always have something to do, so I would read then. And Erich would not have lunch, and sometimes I would go and sit with him then. So one day I went and visited Erich and said, you know, Erich Baba said, the course of human reincarnation is 8,400,000 lifetime. Yeah. Well, if we do the math, you know, if you get a birth and a death cycle back to birth, and consider that 120 some years. And that's not always possible because there are suicides and there are not always available bodies and life places to be. But even if you could get one, I said on the average of 120 some years from birth to birth, I said that would add up to a billion years. Erich just chuckled and said, say two billion. Well, obviously that can't happen on one planet. So that means all of us have been on many other planets. We're just here now. So he's explaining about the preparation of planets in the lineage. But when you talk about the earth that has to take the place of this one, he's talking about the spiritual center of the universe, which is being prepared, not just some other planet, but the spiritual center of the universe, which is a very unique position. Okay, now what's very also impactful about Baba's statement about so many lifetimes of human reincarnation, we know that he stated that, and not just Baba, but the perfect masters also, this one and this one and that, they're on their last lifetime. You have one more, you have two more. Gandhi, for an example, he said he has three more. He'll be a perfect master in the 22nd century. To see... People at the last section of existence that we knew them very well. And they were just very natural and casual. They weren't all like money and Erich. Some of them were eccentric, but nonetheless, they were unique personalities. And Baba said they were on the end. It was all over for them. They're just playing it out. Amazing. Can you ask that again about forgiveness? You talk about that as being so important in terms of selfishness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't sure I captured all of what you were saying, and I wanted you to repeat it mm -hmm. and or elaborate on the importance of forgiveness. One of the most important things that the people who lived with Baba, Mondali and others, experienced was that Baba would give them a chance through humiliation sometimes, to be able to give in. And whether they would do that or not, we have examples both ways. Some couldn't do it, some could. Some of our best explanations from Baba and discourses on the subject of cooperation and giving in came when he started the Nasik Ashram for the new Western disciples and how compared to the Easterners, they really didn't have much of a clue. 
because Bob was so natural with them and they knew who he was, but yet how to relate to that when it came to laying down the habits of their personality and just being at his feet. So there was a period of months of training for them. So we have some very good messages from that time. Baba, for example, would say, be big hearted, give in, get along. Eric Shermani would say, he told us things through the years, but he said, one thing I can't do for you, I can't make you get along with each other. You have to do it. So Baba had, in the Mandali, had strong personalities. And sometimes, for his own work and enjoyment, he would cause friction between people. He would think it was funny. But it was all his work, the process of the final end for them. Because they, after all, whatever was left in their impressions, it was just the end. And he allowed it to play out. It was his amusement. Because he knew their hearts were all good. Only for him. Did you say that the only way to overcome selfishness was through forgiveness? Forgiveness and not making a show of it. To make a show of forgiveness is not selfless. But forgiveness, real forgiveness, is the absolute antidote to self-interest. That's it. I'll give you an example Pendu would tell us. You know, we are in the spiritual training program as young residents of Marambad, and it wasn't always a peachy, smooth sail. And sometimes it would happen. And I remember Pendu's advice to me. Sometimes you just say, I'm sorry. Even if you think you were right, forget about it. Just apologize. Say, oh, I'm sorry. And it's amazing what it can do. And then on the other hand, Bob would accuse Kitty Davy of saying, she apologizes for everything. What is this? But that was different. When you were with the Mondali, you were in the grind no matter what. Money used to say, you need the three H's to be with Baba. Humility, honesty, and humor. Jay Baba. Baba. Jay Baba. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter.